Wow. Uh, first, let me start in German. Uh, guten Abend, everyone. <laughs> so, for the next 60 minutes, probably a bit less, we are going to talk about reversing uh, communication protocols. But we are going to target a specific communication protocols, which is a botnet communication protocol, quite known, named Zero Access. So, who are we? Um, first, we are French. So, sorry for the accent. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. So, Frédéric, just here, is an IT security engineer in France. He's specialized in reverse engineering, of course, and his um, field of interest are the system analysis and the hardening and the um, trusted computing. Me, I'm a PhD student, member of the Supelec Elite School Cyber Research Team. <laughs> My advisors are Guillaume Yet and Ludovic May. Hello. And I'm specialized in intrusion detection, botnet simulation, and of course, protocol learning. We are both um, from the French company named Amosis. It's a um, security company with Audit and Eval. Not, not Amosis, Amosis. <laughs> Audit and Evaluation. And we also do research and development. Uh, that's uh, what we are going to talk about today. So, topics. Uh, we are going to reverse a uh, protocol. We are going to simulate endpoints once we've reversed it. And finally, we are going to try or we are going to map the botnet. So, why do we do reverse engineering of protocols? Um, first of all, protocols can find them everywhere, you can find them between um, endpoints can find between uh, communication of uh, process between processes, you can find between uh, that when a binary talk with its uh, libraries or with a device, for example. And you can even find protocols inside Tamagotchis, for example, if you've seen the talk of yesterday. So what do, why do we need to do reverse engineering? First of all, we, we like to do some uh, test analysis, robustness analysis of implementation of protocols like if you want to fuzz the control IP of a centrifuge. And uh, if you saw some talk yesterday, the talk about uh, fuzzing and vulnerability analysis of some uh, implementation of protocols, like those with uh, Tamagotchi and SXE binaries, um, you may want to analyze traffic to find and to identify potential leakage of uh, sensitive information. Like if you want to be sure, like, uh, that your IP reputation appliance doesn't leak any uh, sensitive uh, critical information. You may want to do reverse engineering when you want to compare the implementation of a protocol with its specification, like in common criteria when you do security evaluation of products, you have to do the evaluation of specification and its implementation. And uh, last but not least, you may want to develop an open source version, a free version of a protocol implementation when this, product, this implementation is proprietary. So you want to do reverse engineering. And if you have seen the talk of Drew Fisher last year, maybe he's here, I don't know. Uh, he talked about the reverse engineering of Kinect protocol, and it was quite interesting. So, um, so first, um, first, we are going to present the current reverse engineering approach most of you may um, work with. Um, please, can you raise your hand if you've already reversed uh, communica communication protocols? Or try to? Okay? <laughs> Don't move. Um, please, um, did you look like this when you tried to reverse a uh, protocol? <laughs> okay. Um, that's the common scenario when you try to reverse uh, communication protocols nowadays. You have uh, lots of flows, hexadecimal flow, and you stare at them for days and try to find relations, size fields, and CRCs, and, and co. That's horrible. It's uh, complex, time consuming. You have to be a guru of encoding to be able to do this kind of stuff. And it's uh, mostly manual. I had, it, uh, I had it mostly visual because you stare at bytes for days and days and it's uh, 
like this uh, that you reverse uh, communication protocols nowadays. So uh, we looked at this problem and tried to uh, think about creating a tool that would help us to reverse efficiently a communication protocol. So this was, this was a starting point for our research two years ago and we wanted to find some way to automate uh, the reverse engineering of protocols. So we look at some uh, uh, well-known protocols like TCP and we wanted to find some characteristics that we can uh, then automate to infer. So let's take TCP. TCP has some, uh, you have so different types of messages like uh, scene, hike, push and so on messages. You have the notion of a uh, concept of uh, encapsulation layers. TCP is encapsulated inside IPv4, which is encapsulated inside Ethernet. So you have uh, layers of protocols. Um, and inside the protocols, you have the notion of field partitionings. Uh, messages are split in fields that, are, that have specific size, either dynamic or static. And inside those fields, you have relations. Here, here we have a, a specific relation with is the offset of the starting of the data. So we, it, um, it relies between uh, two, uh, two, uh, two fields. And you have another kind of relation, which is inter-symbol or inter-message relation, uh, like the sequence number the and the annihilation number of uh, TCP. And um, other kind of um, characteristic we can find, it's contextual values. It means uh, values that are specific to the environment. And you have application level um, data of values. And uh, last, you have some um, sequence of valid messages. It means the uh, authorized list of messages you have to send to be able to talk with a real implementation. So these are some characteristics that are quite common in many, many <coughs> protocols. So when you want to reverse a um, communication protocol and to help the expert when he's reversing the protocol, you need to be able to automatically find all these informations. Okay, so in order to do, this, to do this, we'll find a model which will represent a protocol and we'll create a strategy or a tool which will help us to infer or learn the model. That's good, I'm part of an academic world and I'm like, I like uh, models, like uh, most of the academics. And um, this time is not a useless model. We've um, taken the model from uh, Gerard Holzman. It's a French, I think. He published um, a book, a very good book if you're interested in reversing communication protocols, named The Design and Validation of Computer Protocols, and he described protocols in five parts. You will see it's mostly academic work. Uh, a protocol is defined with a service, meaning uh, each protocol has been uh, created for a special purpose, okay, a special objective. Um, this model also includes some uh, in assumptions on the environment. Uh, when you create a protocol, you create it for um, IPv uh, encapsulation, for example, or for wireless uh, communications, or for, so you have some assumption on the environment. You put in your model some messages, the vocabulary of your protocol, so the list of messages, the encoding form and the format of all these messages. You add the grammar of your protocol, the procedure rules is the academic term for sequence of valid messages. And you have a model. Okay. For us, it's way too much complicated to learn this model. We have too much data to learn um, and it's uh, quite impossible using um, automatic approach. So we try to reduce this model to something that we can manage. So we simplify the protocol model with two parts. The first is the vocabulary, the list of messages it contains, and the grammar will represent with a state machine. That's quite common. So, uh, since we've um, find, uh, we found a, a model to represent a protocol, we've created a tool named NetZub that we'll introduce that will help the experts to learn this model. So NetZub is a project that we started two years ago. Uh, it's an open source project. It's available on the internet. 
and it has uh, three main goals. The first one is to, able, to be able to infer to reverse communication protocols, especially proprietary protocols. The second one is to be able to simulate and generate uh, traffic, realistic traffic, that so, are um, so, uh, uh, understandable by uh, real implementation. And the third goal is to be able to, smart, to do smart phasing based on the knowledge of the protocol we've just learned. So, three main goals. Uh, the, the approach we've taken in Sinezob is uh, as either pa passive and active inference. Uh, by passive, I mean just observing some traces and trying to infer the, the message format and the grammar of the protocol. And by active, I mean talking with uh, an oracle, a re-implementation. We use a semi-automatic uh, approach. By that, I mean that uh, it's not entirely automated. Uh, the expert has to, to do some tweak to specify some parameters to understand the, and to better understand the protocol. And we don't use, um, we don't rely on binary manipulation, either static or dynamic analysis. We only observe traces. So this is the big picture of NetZub, its architecture. It has four main components. The first one is the import component. So we have capture and uh, importer. You can capture network flow, IPC, uh, inter-process communication flow. You can uh, integrate files, XML files, and you can uh, either uh, capture API flow. <coughs> I mean, uh, API flows that are taken from the OSPI project. So we handle those uh, um, importer. You have the heart of NetZub, which is, which is a protocol inference part either um, vocabulary inference and grammar inference. And when you know, you understand the protocol, you have uh, reversed the protocol, you can either simulate and generate traffic, or you can export the protocol to a third-party product. Uh, for simulation, you can simulate a client, server, and you can do phasing. And regarding the export component, you can export to XML text format, and you can export uh, in a few days, because it will be released in a few days, um, <laughs> to pitch uh, further uh, and to Wireshark or Scapy if you want to dissect some uh, proprietary protocols. So, I, as I've said, it's uh, totally open source. Uh, so, it's, it's uh, written in Python. We, we have a pretty nice graphical interface. And uh, we have also a plugin architecture. So it allows you to create some importer or exporters if you want to handle new captures, a new communication channel, or new third party products, for example. And this uh, project is available through many, through many ways. Uh, this is a team that participates in NetZub. Uh, it's 12, almost 12 uh, people, and we have two main sponsors currently Amosis and the Cypelec um, School. Um, with NetZub, we try to be at the state of the heart in different domains, those uh, six domains, and especially in reverse engineering of protocols, in grammar inference, and uh, more for George, in the behavior analysis of uh, botnet, a common and control channel. So we try to be and to propose new, uh, new way in, uh, in research. So that was NetZub, the project. Now we will see how to use NetZub to reverse engineer the zero access control and command channel. So, um, zero access is a well known botnet, um, still in activity. Um, I think it has been discovered in something ar around September uh, from the last year. And it's um, two months ago, Sophos um, has mapped around one million zombies in, in this uh, botnet. And um, like most of the current uh, inactivity botnets, its objective is to gain money. So it executes click, fr click fraud and uh, Bitcoin mining uh, to uh, get money. And uh, we are interested in the two, um, we've looked at the two versions of the rootkits, the binary, and um, we will for this presentation, consider, focus, the latest version of the botnet. So you have um, a peer-to-peer -peer management system in this botnet. It allows to, peer, to um, share the peer directory or to share files, and it uses uh, UDP and TCP to connect between each uh, zombie. Okay? Uh, inside each binary, you have a set of hard-coded bootstrapped IPs, 
um, the, the zombie connect to these peers and retrieves the peers directory and can speak like any peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So we are going to play with your peer-to-peer -peer protocol. First, we have some requirements, of course. We need real communication traces. Uh, we contacted Kevin McNamee. He's the first who reversed the uh, encryption protocol of the uh, Zero Access botnet. He sent us some traces, real traces. We de deliberately infected one of our machines to gain more traces. Okay? And we also, a few days ago, downloaded from Contagio. It's a website, a blog, where you have some samples uh, of the any malware. And he published um, some pickups of zero access. So we downloaded all these three sources of traces and used them to reverse the protocol. We also used a confined environment and the binary of the malware for the grammatical part of the inference. But we won't go deeper in it because it's quite long to explain. We use as any confined environment uh, the firewalls and virtual machine and, and stuff. Please, if you do this, um, consider legal issues um, before uh, installing manual, um, some, before infecting your, your own machine with the botnet. So first, you need to extract from the traces some data flows. So this is the kind of data flows you obtain from a pickup from zero access, okay? You split the data flow um, using uh, previous knowledge of the sub-protocol used, like if it's over TCP or over UDP, over USB, you can split the data flow in messages, first message, second message. And you can also use, uh, within NetZub, uh, delimiter-based uh, splitter. And you import these messages into NetZub. You can uh, either uh, use Wireshark and export into NetZub or uh, use the capture module which uh, sniff your Ethernet uh, card or anything and import messages into NetZub. So once you've obtained traces and uh, provided them to NetZub, you can start reversing the vocabulary of the protocol. So the goal of this um, first step is to abstract messages. Um, so you have a raw messages, raw binary data, and um, this data contains some specific uh, values that are specific to the environment, like IP, timestamp, <coughs> and so on. And the goal is to decontextualize those specific values to uh, have an abstract value of uh, this uh, information. And to do that, the idea is to regroup messages by similarity and to then those uh, similar groups to find contextual variation, contextual values. In order to uh, regroup messages by similarity, we rely in NESOB on, the, on their common partitioning. I will explain now. Um, how do we do partitioning of uh, messages together? We, we, we uh, support many ways inside NESOB. The first way is quite simple. It's a simple alignment. So it's only uh, separa separa try to separate static and dynamic variations on the um, columns. Second way is quite simple also. Uh, you have delimiter-based alignment, so you use the delimiter and you try to split messages according to this delimiter. <coughs> and the third is quite interesting, which is called uh, second alignment. It tries to find the optimal alignment of two or many messages. And to do second alignment, we rely on um, an algorithm, which is called Needleman and Wunsch. Uh, and which is uh, taken from the biometric, bio, uh, uh, bioinformatic uh, domain. But what is Niederbahn and Wunsch? Let's see. Um, so the idea of applying Niederbahn and Wunsch to do reverse engineering of protocols was, uh, has been initiated by Marshall Bello. Uh, I think it was in 2004 or 2005, something like that. The idea is to, when you have two messages you want to align, so this one. You build a distant matrix, so you take the two messages and you build a row and a, and a line. And then you initialize the matrix with some uh, initial data, the zero. And then you have a formula to fill, uh, to fill the matrix. The formula works as follows. You take the, to fill a cell, let's say this one, 
you have to take uh, the highest score between the top, top one, the left one, or the top left one. And you, with modulo some parameters, you fill the, the entire matrix like this. So when the, the matrix is totally filled, what you do is a trace, trace back. You, st you start from the bottom right and go to the, try to find a path to the um, top left um, by specific values. And the idea, the goal here, is to find the command pattern, the command pattern that corresponds to the better alignment of those messages. So here the result is simply uh, two static, static bytes, the 70 and the 0, which are static, so we align them. And in the middle, you have the dynamic variation, the dynamic part, which, you, which will then correspond to a, a unique, unique field. So here you have three fields, the 70, the dynamic part, and the 0, which is another, three, which is another field. Based on this information, based on this common pattern, uh, in order to manipulate that inside, inside an ESOB, we rely on the regular expression. So we just comp compute a basic um, regular regex, regular expressions that uh, corresponds to this uh, alignment. So this is uh, the, uh, the regular expression of, the, of, the, of this alignment. Here, with this um, regular expressions, it helps inside NetZub to do field partitioning, to split messages between fields. So with this information, we can easily split messages uh, with the inside NetZub with the 70 and the 0. In the middle, you have the dynamic part. So you have the static fields and the dynamic fields. OK, so now you are able to do um, partitionment of fields with many messages. So let's see how to do similarity with, with them. Um, we need to, since it's an automatic approach, this part of the uh, algorithm, we need to automatically find if the alignment is efficient or not. Okay. So we qualify the alignment with a score. We name it the uh, similarity score or measure. And we compute it for each pair of messages and try to find the best alignment using this score. So we define a similarity score. If uh, two messages has a zero for similarity score, it means they have nothing in common. Whereas if uh, it's 100% uh, similar, it means uh, messages are almost identical. So we define few um, scores or ratios we use to define if the um, alignment is efficient or not. We won't go too much in it, in deeper in, in these scores, but uh, we allow it to uh, create um, and add any um, additional factors we could, uh, that you would be interested in. So the first uh, factor or score is the ratio of dynamic fields over the total length of bytes, whereas the second um, similarity measure, I would say, is the, common, uh, the ratio of common dynamic bytes uh, over the two messages. You take these two factors, you normalize, compute the uh, similarity score here, and you can have uh, with this solution a, a number between 0 and 100 that you can use to compare between other pairs of messages. This will bring us to the uh, clustering process of the alignment. So we use the UPGMA clustering algorithm, famous. It's a hierarchical clustering. Um, we put all the messages in a matrix, okay? We put a similarity score. So here, this message is 50% similar with this message. And we find the highest score and reduce by matching the, me the messages, the more common, and reduce the matrix. Okay. It's an iterative process. And it allows to find similar messages which have similar elements. Okay. It creates a um, similarity tree. It has a very difficult name in uh, bioinformatics. I don't remember it. Phylogenetic tree, yeah. And using this tree, we can find clusters and find equivalent messages automatically. Uh, here we have uh, one, two, three, and four cluster of messages. 
This means that uh, all the blue messages are identical, for example, and the, the pink messages are mostly identical. Uh, that, the, uh, that was the theory aspect of the clustering. When we uh, implemented these into NetHub, we used uh, this kind of uh, graphical representation. You have all the messages here, and the left part, the clustering, so the groups of messages you are looking at. So once you've obtained clusters of similar messages, and once you've um, find fields into these messages, you need to understand what do they contain, what you, what's the meaning of each byte into the messages. So before going further, in, in, um, in, in inferring the characteristics of the field, let's see what is the model we use inside NetZub. The bottom, the top part of the model is uh, quite simple. You have uh, raw messages. These raw messages can be split in layers, in protocol layers. Like, for example, you can have Ethernet and here IPv4. And each layer can be split in fields. It's quite simple. This partitioning, this strategy of uh, multiple partitioning allows for multiple partitionment um, alignment, for example. And this is a complete part of the, of the model. So for each field, you have some specific attributes. You have the attributes that are specific to these sides, which can be either fixed or viable. You have some interpretation attributes, how to interpret uh, row bytes, either I, I, as integer, string, as key, and so on. Uh, the indi indianess is a sign, for example. You have some transformation attribute. We will talk about that just, before, just after. And you have the definition domain of the field, how it varies, how, what is the uh, authorized values for this field. Uh, this field can be uh, static, random, and can have some dependencies on other fields on, or uh, on other uh, messages. And you have an optional characteristic, which is a field, which is a semantic, sorry. And the semantic is optional because you don't always need the, to understand what is the meaning of a field to generate traffic. You can just re, uh, replay traffic and it will be okay for real implementation. So this was uh, quite a um, tough uh, explanation. So we wanted to, because we have 60 slides left, we wanted to make a small uh, pause, a small interlude. So we'll do during five minutes some uh, knitting. <laughs> I'm kidding now. So, <laughs> how, do, how does the transformation work? Um, and why do we need transformation? Because you have some uh, raw binary data that are, uh, we, we don't know what is it. And in fact, on, on the reality, the meaning of those bytes is interesting when you have the clear text. So you can have encoded data like ZOR or the grammar SN1 uh, uh, encoded uh, data. And you, have, you can have encrypted values, like um, if you have uh, XOR-based uh, encryption, uh, like we will see just after. So we have some uh, transformation to handle to, have the to obtain the clear text of the data we want to analyze. To do that, we have and we support transformation functions. Uh, I mean some functions you can implement inside NetZub to transform data uh, to application-level bytes. So you can either uh, apply those transformation functions on messages, layers, and fields, and you can, uh, with NetZub, uh, use uh, pre provided functions. We support some base64 uh, conversion and some uh, zip uh, completion function. And what is interesting here is that you can add your own custom transformation function. This is what we did for uh, the zero access botnet communication channel because it uses a uh, XOR-based, a really simple XOR-based obfuscation function. So inside NetZub, you can add your own uh, code in Python, in the graphical interface, to transform some um, raw messages inside clear text messages. And then you can work on it to understand the meaning of the, of the field. So let's see now how to handle uh, relations. Okay. So before relations, uh, the expert uh, has um, 
quite a good view on the vocabulary of the protocol. He is reversing. He has the messages clustered in um, similar groups. Okay, each message has been splitted in fields, and he has a bit of a knowledge of the evolution and the variations of each field. If it's a static or if it's a dynamic field, if it's um, uh, smallly uh, variated or, or not. But there is something every uh, reverse is looking after, is to find automatically relations. That's the kind of problem when you have a value that depends of something else, like uh, when you have um, a field which contains the binary ID of the botnet, it contains the file name, the affiliate ID, or when the field contains um, a value of the size of another field, or if it contains a CSC of another field. That's the kind of relations you have always in protocols and that you want to find and to reverse when you are looking after an unknown protocol. So how can we reverse automatically or how can we find, help the experts to find these relations? We use the maximal, I'm sorry, it's <laughs> Math, maximal Information Coefficient Correlation System provided by the MIT. It's very efficient. Um, it allows to correlate the value of multiple fields and to find, um, and to, to find uh, fields which are highly correlated. Okay? Once uh, you have these pairs, you can qualify the kind of correlation and compute if it's a size field or if it's a CRC or something else. Um, it's quite simple. You, for each field, you generate a set of data, like you take the value of the field, you take the size of the dynamic fields, you have more uh, data, like you concat fields one with the other and compute their value, their size, you create n-grams, it's when you split data in short uh, segments of four or eight bits or uh, we also consider the CRC value of a field or the MD5 value of the field and, and therefore. When we uh, have computed all this value, we find for uh, relations between these values using the uh, MINE algorithm. So we measure the dependencies between each pair and we rank pairs by the score. Um, two simple examples. We compute the mine of the uh, value of the first field with the size of the second field. The score is one, the maximum. It means it's a size field. Okay? It's quite simple. Uh, another typical relation is the CRC relation. We compute the correlation factor between the value of the, of the field and the um, CRC substitute of a set of fields. If it's a high score, it means it's the CRC relation. So that was for the um, normal relations in protocols. We have another set of uh, relations which are the environment dependencies. It's when the uh, um, value of a field depends of uh, the context, like the hour, what, what time is it, if the protocol sends the timestamp or if it sends the IP address. That's the kind of environmental relations you have in common protocols. So in order to automatically find these relations or to help the experts find them, when you import data into NetZub, we store such, uh, lots of metadata like the current um, dates, the current protocol, uh, sub-layer protocol, the IP address if it's a network protocol, the um, uh, name of your Windows session, for example, this kind of metadata and we search them into your uh, vocabulary. Okay. okay, that was the vocabulary inference. There are more features, we won't have time to go deeper in, in them. We'll show you a short demo at the end. Um, I'll speak about grammar inference now. Um, the grammar of a protocol is the sequence of messages which I exchanged, like the three-way handshake in TCP, okay? So how can we uh, automatically infer the grammar of a protocol? We use an automata. That's quite simple. You have two states, for example, 
uh, when you say in the attack you expect to receive success and that's the common definition for IO automata, input output automata. We change it to a different model, we name it uh, SMMDT, I won't tell what it means. <laughs> it only includes a probability, okay, so when you send attack, you have 80% chance to receive fail or to receive uh, with 20% the success. We also included the reaction time into the grammar, so when you succeed, it's often more fast, for example, and when you fail, it can be a two-second operation. So that was the model of the grammar. That um, this schema now is the, how we can infer automatically the grammar of a protocol. We use the Angrin L star algorithm, famous. We have a learner, uh, your computer as a reverser. It sends um, queries to a confined zombie. So you put your malware into a virtual box, you send data to the malware, and you, using probe, external probe, you compute if it's valid or not, if it answers or not. Given all the information you retrieve, you create an hypothesis model. And when this model is big enough, you uh, can compare it to the real one. I won't go more in it. We have implemented this algorithm and more and some uh, little tricks in it into NetZub. If you want to test it, you can do not hesitate. That's the kind of results you obtain. It's a very simple uh, grammar of the zero access protocol. It opens a uh, communication channel. It sends and receives something with but I'm sorry, it's small, with different probabilities, and it closes the channel and turns like this, very simple. So now that we've inferred the vocabulary and the grammar part of a protocol, we'll show how we can generate traffic. So the simulation part of, of NetZub um, is interesting because you know the protocol, you infer the protocol, so now you can simulate, generate traffic. Uh, so you can simulate either a client or server, or both client and server inside NetZub, and you can talk to a real implementation if you want. You have to understand the distinction, distinction between a client and server, and the initiator and responder of the communication channel. For example, you can have a TNS uh, session, that is, that uh, the TCP session is open by the server, so we handle such a uh, characteristic. We also handle um, the abstraction from the communication channel. For example, if you want to send TCP messages over a USB channel, or if you want to send uh, uh, IPC traffic over a file, let's say. We use a memory mechanism. We use it for, uh, to memorize previously seen fields, for example, like IP, that we want to re-inject in future messages. Uh, this is quite interesting, and I will show you an example here. So, uh, this is um, a simple um, uh, generation of traffic of the zero access communication uh, command and control channel. Um, we, at the, at the input, uh, we, uh, we have um, raw binary data that uh, is taken by the communication channel of NetZub, and then by the abstraction layer, we are able to understand what is the message we've just uh, received. We have a get L symbol, which means it's a peer request. The peer request for other peers. It's a peer request. And um, we send this information inside the grammar model, the uh, state automate automaton. And this uh, grammar model tells us that uh, if we receive the get L symbol, we have to send the retail symbol, so thanks to the, to the model. And then we can use the, uh, we can send the retail symbol, but first we have to contextualize it. So we, uh, we send the retail symbol inside the abstraction layer, and then we send, sorry, we, um, we uh, send the retail symbol inside the abstraction layers, and inside the abstraction layers, we, we use the memory that tells us that we have seen some previous IP and we use them to build the message, the packet. And then we send them inside the output device. 
Okay, so this was, this was the simulation part of NetZob, and now we will so we'll show you some demo. Um, we didn't want to do it um, live, to do live demo, so we captured our, our screen uh, during the demos, before the uh, current talk, and we'll show you the video. The first video is a um, halfway, um, two times uh, faster than the reality, only for timing problems. And the second video is a normal time. So here it's uh, the NetZob application. Um, we create a project. Oh, sorry. Okay. We select uh, pickups to import in it. Okay. So we selected um, a pickup. We decided to only consider the UDP uh, sub uh, protocols and we select messages we want to reverse. Okay. So we select every messages and import them into NetZone. Okay. So that's the normal view for um, uh, reversing a protocol. You have all the messages in the hexadecimal flow and you will try to, in, um, to find all the stuff we've presented just before. So the first um, things every reverser do is to decrypt the protocol. Um, so here we select the um, uh, Kevin decryption routine and insert it into NetZub and apply it. So here we have the um, encrypted uh, in, um, imported data, and here is the um, uh, decrypted data. Okay, so we can close the encrypted and work on the decrypted. Here it's the, um, the byte distribution view. We have uh, here the first byte of every messages. Here is the last byte of every messages, and their values are here. So this graph is very efficient. It tells us that here we have something highly um, compressed or highly entropic, or which value varies um, quite well. And here we have something we might be interested in looking at because there is a pattern in the field value and we will try to understand why this protocol looks like this. So we execute the clustering and sequence alignment algorithm. It's not so, doesn't take too long. And we obtain two clusters. The first one here uh, only contains one message. And the second one here contains 26 message, different messages. This means that this message is very different than the others. So we'll consider the 26 other messages. Okay. And as we can see, the messages has been split in fields, dynamic and static fields, and we'll now try to understand what does these fields mean. We can change the visualization format of the fields, like here in string. We can find that it's a retail message. It's when you finish to reverse the protocol, you name this message retail. So you rename it retail. This one was the getL message. So we can come back to the byte distribution uh, view and show that we find we found a lot of fields in the specific part we were looking at. And now we'll execute the environmental dependencies research. This means that we're going to search for lots of different data into these uh, messages, like the uh, timestamps, the uh, layer three uh, uh, destination address, and all other stuff. And it tells us something like 83 occurrences found. We search for them. Okay, here in green, it tells us that the, um, it's the hexadecimal value of the IP address we've captured. 
So we can say that this field is an IP field. We can change the visualization format. And we have here all the IP of the protocol. We can apply this to all the fields. And it's the uh, peer exchanged through these messages. OK. That was the a simple view of the um, re uh, reversing the zero access vocabulary protocol. And now we will show you how we can use this to Thank you. We will show you how we can use this to simulate a fake zombie in order to map the, map the, map the botnet. Sorry. Sorry. So this video was taken a few hours ago in the, uh, in the conference. Sorry for the traffic. <laughs> so we created a very simple grammar. It opens a communication channel, send messages, and close the communication channel and reopen it and open and send messages. So we are going to retrieve all the peers of the botnet just like this by sending getl messages, passing the responses, so the retl messages, ident identifying in it all the IP address we received and use them to reconnect and reconnect to this IP. So Okay, so that's the initial state of the grammar. We will start by the S0. It's the um, number of attempts and the time before opening the communication channel. That the, the transition which allows to send a message and to expect something in response. And that's the close channel transition. Very simple. So based on this grammar, we will create a um, simulator, um, botnet actor. We give its name. We say it's an initiator, meaning it's our um, actor which will start the communication. Okay? It's us who will send the first message. We say it's an UDP client. And we say here, the first, um, that's a um, real botnet IP. So we'll first start by, start by this IP and retrieve its peers and try to map the botnet based on this um, American IP, I think. OK? Just before I show you that there is nothing in shark, And we send getl, and we start to receive retl. And we do this very fast. And we can see that we send UDP packets and receive uh, UDP packets from the botnet. This means that we efficiently reverse the protocol because we are able to generate valid and realistic traffic. <laughs> That's the um, get and message we sent and that the response. Okay, and um, we just uh, extracted all the IP from this uh, communication, so it was a two minutes mapping attempt. <coughs> and we created a small script in Python to display the results of our <coughs> Google Earth, just for fun. <laughs> Sorry, this was over uh, Windows computer because Google wasn't working on a computer, so it's a different video. <coughs> so we open the generated file. It takes a few minutes. Okay. <coughs> so it's a two minutes mapping of the botnet, and we have uh, all the red points, which are the actors of the zombie. Um, most of them are in US or in Europe. Here it's the US botnet. Here are, we didn't hide the IP address. I don't know if it will cause us a problem. But. <laughs> and that's the Europe. 
we will just have a look at the Hamburg city just to see if uh, someone in Hamburg has been infected by the botnet. <laughs> <coughs> um, yes. And this IP has, IP has been infected. <laughs> Some few words about the future of NetZub. Um, we saw the inference part, the simulator <coughs> and part, and now we want to focus on phasing, on phasing proprietary protocols especially. So we want to, in, to insert uh, the phasing um, proper, uh, characteristic inside NetZub, and this will allow to, to phase undocumented and proprietary protocols. We also want to support more um, communication channels. So if you want, especially, if, and thanks to our, our plugin architecture, we can uh, easily integrate a USB IOCTL uh, capturer, for example. Um, we also want to, to support more export uh, plugin to third party products. And we are at, three, uh, at many days to, uh, to release some uh, plugins for uh, Wireshark, SCAPI, and Pitch Feather. So for Wireshark and Scapy, this, is, this will allow to dissect, to analyze proprietary protocols or undocumented protocols inside well-known and established uh, tools. And for uh, Pitch, this will allow to phase uh, proprietary protocols with uh, well-known uh, and established tools. Okay, this is a feature net dub. And if you want to contribute to, to write your own capturer or exporter, we'll, uh, we'll be glad to, uh, to help you. So, some few words about the conclusion and the, <coughs> some uh, insights. Um, protocol reverse engineering is quite active at the academic level, but very few active at the uh, hacker level, because we only uh, reverse manually or visually. Um, and as our knowledge, um, we are not um, aware of other tools that provide uh, vocabulary inference and grammar inference. So I think it's uh, quite interesting to, to fill the gap between academic and uh, hackers' uh, domain. We are also open to all kinds of contributions, especially if, if you have uh, feedbacks, if you want to try the uh, we encourage you to try it and to give us some feedbacks. If you find some bugs, because there are some bugs, uh, you can provide some bug fix and especially feature proposal. If you have some ideas, uh, some stuff we didn't implement it, so it will be interesting to hear from you. And, and we also support some translation, uh, so we support French and English. And if you want to write your own uh, language uh, uh, translator, we, it's okay. So if you have any questions, we'll be glad to help you. Thanks, George and Frederic. So now we're opening to questions, and you're finding the microphones. You know the drill. All right, let's start over here. Uh, hi, thanks for the soul. I think you just got this download spike, but uh, okay. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the external dependencies. So, for example, lots of protocols are uh, timed, so dependent on the external clocks. For example, how well does your tool handle that? So the, the communication needs to be slotted, time slotted, for example. Okay. Um, Time-based um, uh, protocol are quite difficult, of course. It's why we um, edited the IO Automata grammar state machine, and we added the reaction time coefficient into the transition between states. This means that if you, um, if a, a message is valid um, only after a, po a break of 10 seconds we can create uh, uh, this kind of uh, transition and support this uh, kind of protocols. Uh, have you tried it on some type of protocol? Yep, yep, yep. Any more questions? 
Hi, first, uh, it's an impressive work and thanks. Uh, the second is that the protocol you showed us is essentially a binary protocol. What about text-based protocols? Yep. Um, we think that uh, binary protocols are more difficult to, to understand. So here we, sh we showed uh, um, quite interesting protocol because it's well, well used in uh, malware act activities. And, but we can easily, we can easily um, work on the text-based protocol, especially with the second alignment. Because binary protocols, it's, it's better to use a simple alignment or a delimiter-based alignment. Uh, but for text-based uh, protocol like uh, HTTP, uh, FTP, ERC, uh, it's really easy to use second segment. So you have a really good understanding of the fields partitioning, and then it's quite easy to understand the meaning of the fields. Thanks. And we have a question from the internets. We have two questions. Let's do one at a time. Three. Um, okay. The first one was. Um, what does a ZOP part of NetZOP really mean? <laughs> They're, they can be really creative. Um, it means officially uh, <laughs> uh, network modelization by reverse engineering. Um, you need to find letters and you combine them and it creates NetZOP. <laughs> All right, based on the quality of that question, let's go back to the room. Um, really, really great tool. It fills, uh, it, it, fi it fills uh, a space that hasn't been yet filled by tools, so it's really, really useful. Uh, you meant it as a general tool, right? For n not only for the specific protocol of the botnet, but for general use. Okay? So um, w are you planning to implement um, protocol decryption. Uh, it also wasn't really clear from the presentation, from the video, how, how you decrypted the protocol using this tool. Uh, I, I have, of course, uh, Skype in mind, which has have he heavy encryption before even you can start looking at fields. Okay. Um, it, it's not magic. We cannot um, reverse the decryption routine of the protocol. So in this example, in, to, in zero access, someone gave us the um, XOR based obfuscation algorithm and we insert it into a transform transformation function and we apply it to the communication protocol. So we don't decrypt automatically the messages but we'll help you to try different kind of encryption and we'll help you to try to apply in different orders so you, you can change everything, the endianness, the uh, byte, uh, byte order and everything, and you can apply different kind of algorithm. But we won't be able to um, find automatically the private key of the uh, Skype or something like this. So, so there is some kind of interface to do that, to, to enter the algorithm yourself? Yeah, um, um, in, there is a, in the slide, uh, there is a, um, we've shown how we created the transformation function. And this was the decryption, pla uh, the place where you can put your Python code to decrypt uh, a field, a layer, or all your messages. And uh, I'd, I'd also like to add a note that I think this tool is quite universal. You can actually, it, it looks to me, you can actually use it for um, mapping wire protocols, for example, uh, JTAG, uh, some custom protocols, and stuff like that. Yes. Thanks. Um, yeah, we. We really would like to apply this tool to any kind of protocol, uh, not for language uh, protocols, but for um, informatic protocols. I think they can it can apply to files, to configuration files, for example. It can apply to IPC exchange. It can apply to network messages, of course. But for any kind of communication protocols, you can uh, use it to um, be more efficient into your work. All right, let's take another question from the internets. Uh, second one is, is NetsOp usable as a Python library, API, or just through the GTK UI? Um, it's not yet um, implemented, but we really would like to create an API and the, um, uh, to be able to use only your Python console and to reverse your protocol without the graphical interface. 
but it's not been, it has not been yet um, created. So the internets have redeemed themselves. <laughs> oh wait, I think you're here first. Okay. Uh, great work, can't wait to try it. Um, did you say there was support for reversing um, binary file formats as well, or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> And that's how we like the questions here, short and sweet. Uh, okay, thanks. Really great work from my perspective. Um, the thing is, um, you started to invent this method to reversing a binary protocol. So the thing is, um, you can only start to with, with a method if you have some binary stuff on the one side and one clear text stuff on the other side. What do you do to prove that it works? You use TCP itself or what was it? You, you mean if you really reverse the protocol, if you understood the protocol? Uh, you, How you to prove the correctness okay. that your method is working? You, a, a way to, to, um, to be sure that you really understood the protocol is to use a simulator engine and to talk to a real implementation. And if you can talk to a real implementation, and if it answers you, and you can uh, guide, guide them, guide it to, uh, to a specific state in the state machine, I think it's a good proof that uh, it works. Uh, I know completely that it works, but um, you have a start point from something binary, and then you have something, I think, on the other side, more, more or less a clear text, like TCP, or a, every, everybody knows how TCP works. So what you used to start this, only the proof that the point on the other side is reacting to you, or um, I, wanna, I wanna see, in the end, I wanna see how powerful this tool is. Um, to, to answer the first one, we can also, we would like to create an exporter for uh, Wireshack because it will allow us to compare um, previously created this sector for Wireshack, the official one, yeah. with the automatically inferred and created one. So if we can compare the Wireshack dissectors yeah. of the two of the protocol, and if the two matches, it, it means the reverse um, went well. Yeah. And um, for the, your question, I think you're talking about the um, grammatical inference part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are never sure that the um, message we sent uh, gener generated an answer or not. We have some um, um, time measures. And if we did not uh, receive something be between the first or the second seconds, yeah. we consider that the message was wrong. Okay. okay, okay, thanks. And we have one more question from the internet. Yeah, um, are there any plans to support passive grammar interfer inference in NetsOp from network traces without any active stimulation? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, that's funny because that's exactly what we are um, doing now. Um, because the automatic, the active aspect of the grammatical inference is quite heavy. You need a confined environment, you need to put your binary in it, and you need to send experiments and, and go. Um, so this is very efficient, but time consuming, and you often you do this in the end part of your reverse engineering. Uh, but the passive inference of the grammar would be very fast, very, very fast, and it will be completely automatic, automatical. So when you start NetZone, you will have all the messages listed, and the, um, we could apply the um, passive algorithm to show the, what we um, obtain, the, the maximum grammar, a simple grammar that would explain what, we've, um, in, that what you've imported. So yes, we are planning to, to add a passive grammatical inference in NetZone. That was an excellent question from the internet. I'm impressed. All right, we're, we're a little bit over time, but uh, there's nothing else in this room, so if anyone has to leave, please leave quietly. Otherwise, uh, another question. Hi. 
How can I protect my botnet from being detected by your system? <laughs> Use better encryption. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say you have to try. You have to try the tool, and it will help you to perhaps do these kind of things. More public key. <laughs> yes. Is there a mechanism to feed this into intrusion detection systems and so on? Um, this is also yeah, our plan uh, to, to work on generation of IDS rules based on the <coughs> reverse engineering of protocols. So um, we, try to, we will try to work on this in the next year. But it's too, too early for now to, to say a more uh, thing about it. Yeah, but it's very interesting and we really want to, to do that. Yeah. The, um, the Bro IDS? Sorry. The Bro IDS has a perfect um, API which will allow to implement, to insert our protocol in it. So we, we are looking at it. At it. <coughs> Any more questions? Um, anyone else here? Okay. Um, one person will ask two questions. First, um, how does NetsUp handle IP fragmentation and TCP fragmentation? Uh. And the other one was, uh, can you import XML files, not only uh, PCAP? Okay, um, for the first question, it's very simple. We use the libnids, uh, the library, to reconstruct the um, fragmentations. But we are not very interesting in dealing with this for the moment. But we plan to work on it to be more efficient. And for the second question, of course, you can uh, import binary files, pickup files, but also uh, any. Um, String files like um, ASCII files, like uh, an XML or anything. Any more questions? Um, yeah, if uh, <laughs> um, nobody bothers, um, the internet um, would like to congratulate you uh, for making your work open source. And um, I should ask you if um, uh, you are aware of Canopy, because IRC is questioning itself um, whether um, it that both the two um, tools are, um, getting, are aiming at the same goal, in, in a way. Um, I think Canapé is quite uh, complementary to NetZub. It's a very um, two different approach, approaches. Uh, here we try to, to provide algorithms to help in the inference of protocol, in semi-inference of protocol. In semi automated and transfer protocols. In Ganape, if I understood correctly, they try to provide a debugger to where you can put your own, uh, your own breakpoint, where you can, uh, uh, add, uh, you can modify traffic or generate a, a specific a state machine. I think it's quite, there is no the inference part, the, ref, the inference of the protocol part. I think this is uh, the difference. All right, thanks for all the great questions and thanks to Frederick and George.